My name is uh, Teresa Glaser. Um, I was born in Warsaw and lived there for the first seven years of my life. Um, w when the war started, uh, we lived in a part of Warsaw, Jolibus, where the bombing was quite heavy because nearby there was a railway uh, uh, station, uh, Dworzec Gdansky. On the other side, there was a bridge across the Vistula, and um, our courtyard touched was next to the citadel, um, which sort of held various military trophies and whatnot. And so my father was in the army, and uh, um, the, the, the bombing was quite heavy. Um, so my father said to, to, to my mother, take the children. I had a younger brother, and my gran was visiting us. From, so um, he said, take the children. We had some um, relatives in eastern Poland. Um, you know, away from the bombing. So there was um, a special train provided for the evacuation of uh, uh, army families. And um, so my mother just packed a tiny suitcase because when we were leaving, it was after the 3rd um, um, of September, after England and France declared war on Germany. So everybody expected the war to last only a very short time, Germany to lose, and we'll come back. So um, my mother had to carry Angie, my brother. Um, he, he was too small to sort of walk with us. And um, my granny was there. We, we boarded the train and um, only a few kilometers outside Warsaw, um, some German planes came. They bombarded it. Um, um, the train stopped, and um, everybody sort of got out, and they were hiding in ditches and whatnot. But anyway, the train was um, bombed badly, so it couldn't go any further. So then my mother hired a horse and cart somehow. We all got on to it. And uh, I remember that these German planes, um, they, we saw that they might uh, <clears throat> try to do us harm if they were coming from some important mission, some military mission or something. But no, there were lots of people the, the roads were packed, people were coming with their, all, all their belongings, carrying um, furniture, God knows what. And um, I recently listened to a radio program when they said that in Belgium they did the same, that um, it wasn't just army um, sort of objects which were sort of important to the war, but they, they deliberately wanted to confuse the population, to frighten people, so that uh, they deliberately sort of lowered down and they were um, shooting at us. And when the plane appeared on the horizon, my mother would tell the men to stop and get us down into a ditch and she, she put our heads, one of uh, Andrew's here, mine there, and she said, if we get killed, let it be together. But my grandmother um, wouldn't come down. Um, she had a very old-fashioned um, coiffure sort of high up here, and she had some uh, black stall. And when the plane came, she was waving her umbrella and muttering some curses on them. Uh, I remember looking up, there was a beautiful, very blue sky, it was September, had good weather, and there was the silhouette of, of my, my granny. And, and we traveled through one place, uh, both sides of the road 
were in flame, everything was in flame. Another one was very, very quiet, and there, was, there wasn't anything moving. There were just lots of uh, corpses, peoples and horses' corpses decaying. So it, it really was. to these friends in the East, um, very soon, on the 17th of September, the Russians marched in. So we said, you know, whether to be occupied by the Germans or the Russians, it's the same, at least, you know, we'll be in our own home, so we want to go back. But by that time, the Russians and the Germans divided Poland, and there was a well, it was like a border, so you couldn't just cross it. I mean, some young men probably could, but not my mother would, with a small child, elderly um, mother, grandmother. And so um, they, you had to go um, to an office and get permission to cross to the German side, which my mother did. And it turned out, after talking to other friends, it turned out that this gave them, um, the, the Russians, because, well, they just occupied these territories, they didn't know people, um, this gave them a list of people who, were, who came from other parts of Poland and wanted to go back to their own city. Uh, this gave them a list so that on the night, there had already been two deportations, ours was the third, and they collected everybody who didn't live in eastern Poland, in the borderlands. So they already had a list because these people went to, to get permission to, to cross to. So our um, train was made up of people from other parts of Poland, not the borderland, and there were lots of Jews who, at the start of the war, were running away from Hitler and went volta voluntarily to Russia. But when they saw what it was like there, they quickly got back. So the Russians picked them all up. And uh, we had this, uh, they put us in cattle wagons and uh, um, took about three weeks before we got to our destination. Uh, it stopped uh, in. Uh, a town called Teguldet, which was the last place which had a railway line. And then they took us by boat to some huge woods, huge forests. Someone said that these forests were three times as big as uh, the, the area of Poland. There were no wires or anything, and um, all the people were employed falling trees. 
well, as children we were supposed to to go to school, but I only went for about three days <laughs> because uh, uh, my mom asked me what what did we do, and the first two days they told us um, biographies of uh, Karl Marx and Lenin and uh, Stalin, but then they started asking if any of the parents were sort of naive enough to to have holy pictures or icons. In Russia it's called ikona. Um, and one girl put her hand up and she said that they've got this uh, um, case where her mother keeps her best uh, tablecloth and so on. And at the bottom there is, because she saw it once. Because during the uh, autumn we had, uh, we could collect mushrooms or berries but uh, in the winter, all you had was a, a small portion of clay lad bread. Oh, it smelled so beautiful. And uh, my mother, my grandmother used to say, oh, I can't uh, eat it, it's so rough. Because she could see that my brother was always hungry, so she gave. And um, she died, um, and we had to leave her. In. When you came to Valivade, did you know that a country like India existed? It was the... <clears throat> <clears throat> the British authorities who looked after us when we came out of Russia and uh, after the temporary places in a few months in Tehran, in Akhvat, then in near Karachi, they had to find more permanent camps and uh, the British authorities asked all the, all the Commonwealth countries, Canada, South Africa, and India, and apparently the Indian government was the first who agreed. But they said that the, the Indian government, the Indians are not going to pay a penny towards our upkeep. So the Polish government, which was in London during the war, used to borrow money from the British government on the strength of Polish gold which they managed to smuggle out of Poland before it was occupied by the Germans. So that it was Polish government which um, paid uh, um, for our upkeep and, and so on. We came to Valivada in 1943, uh, so I was 12 years old and I was still at school, primary school. I attended the fifth and sixth grade primary school and just uh, uh, started uh, the first year of my secondary school. We had Polish schools in Valivada. It was like a little Polish town. Polish administration, church, schools, everything. I went to Valivada with my mother and my seven-year-old brother and uh, uh, we lived in uh, a barrack which was um, at the end of an of, uh, um, area. Valivade was divided into five sort of districts and it was right next to the cinema. And we had a cinema built and uh, American films were shown and the Indian people used to come to see people kissing, because apparently at that time Indian films were not, not allowed <laughs> to kiss. And my brother struck a friendship with uh, the projectionist. Somehow the, the little hut with the projection uh, um, equipment was separate from, from the place where people actually saw the film on a screen. Uh, I don't know how it worked. Anyway, my brother, and one day he came up to my mother and he said, uh, Mom, well, when will you buy me a wife? So my mother said, what will we do? But, oh, because she said, this Sanjay had a wife, but she's already 23, so he's buying a younger wife. And I haven't even got one. So my mother said, no, you have to grow up first. Then you... <laughs> Uh, anyway, 
um, we all grew something. Uh, <coughs> the, the barracks were surrounded by <coughs> verandas, and uh, we used to grow climbing plants and bananas, so it was nice and uh, and so when, green. Uh, when you look, uh, what uh, I know it's a long time back, but when you look back at your coming to Valivade, yeah. what is the what are the feelings of seeing India after a long journey and a difficult life at Siberia? What what feelings were there within you? Yeah, well, when you because you we were, already when we came out of Russia, we first stayed in Tehran, then Akhvaz, then Country Club near Karachi. We did not stay. Uh, it, it was the people uh, on the way to Balachadi who stayed in Quetta. No, we stayed in um, Country Club, where we lived in tents, and we already sort of, you know, felt good because uh, we were free after leaving Russia. But it was all communal, communal life. In Country Club, we lived in uh, under tents. There were several tents joined together, and uh, uh, the sides didn't touch the ground, so that you know it'd be um, airy. But that way, <laughs> you know, we had sort of animals um, crossing there and so on. Then in Akhvaz, we lived in stables. I think it is, uh, we were told Maharajas, but Akhvaz is still in Persia, I think. Anyway, it was some prince's stable. Yeah, that is not there. So, uh, did you, when you came to Valivade, uh, when you first came, what would, uh, well, you, you started living for some time. Yeah, the, the, the thing was that in Valivade, we actually had our own place, two rooms and a tiny kitchenette. Even though there were no windows, there was no ceiling, um, we could sort of lock the door and it was ours. For the first time, we sort of felt like, proper, like a proper family, human beings. Even though uh, there were just rafters and in every flat there was a huge wooden table. We just wondered why it was until the monsoon came, then we realized because the, um, there was no ceiling, just rafters and loose tiles on top. Uh, with high winds, they would come tumbling down. So we used to sit under this big table, do our homework, eat our meals during the, the, the very bad monsoon time. We were still at school, um, and I remember that um, uh, in this flat, uh, there was a, uh, a bedroom with three beds, and we had mosquito nets. Now, the mosquito nets were not just protecting us from mosquitoes, but because there was no ceiling, just these rafters, there were things sort of uh, dropping down really like a sc yeah. sort of scorpion. <laughs> and you had to look in your shoe to see if there's a scope, maybe lizards and so on. So when you walk up, you just went like that to, to get rid of anything. Um, and uh, so well, what kind, uh, what, uh, what kind of uh, you were studying? Other elder children were doing some work. Were there workshops, as I read in your book, Holes in India? Uh, so what, what was your mother doing? I mean, your mother was working there? No, my mother, she did work when we were in the country club in Karachi, uh, but uh, in Valivada she didn't. She was just a housewife. The poor housewives had a tiny little ring, a kitchenette, and they, they did marvels. They used to cook meals and bake cakes on it. Also, the ingredients that they could buy were different from the ones that they were used to. Well, first of all, uh, there was no meat, there was only, um, uh, because uh, beef was not obtained, of course there was no pork. Um, there was mutton. There was uh, mutton, and I think co coza, what's coza? Um, okay. Goat, goat. Goat, yeah. yeah. And there were no apples, there was 
a variety of fruit, lovely mangoes and bananas, but not the fruit we were used to, like no, no potatoes, first of all, and no uh, apples. Uh, so where was your father? Uh, oh, my father was in the army. He was fighting in, uh, there was a Polish army uh, under British command, and it was General Underscore. They fought, first of all, they were in Palestine, then they were fighting in Italy, um, Monte Cassino, and so on. Um, Indian troops were there as well. Um, our friend, Colonel Gaikot, um, was also fighting there at a different time from the Polish troops. So, um, children, I, I was first in a sec primary school, then I went to secondary school. And uh, um, the secondary school took people right up to matriculation. Uh, there were, I don't know, over 2,000 children. There was also an orphanage, like the one in Marachadi. The, the Indians who brought flowers to the camp would just pluck the heads and we try to persuade them that we want the stalks as well, not just because they would just pluck the heads. And everyone had to have uh, the mister who fetched water because we had no running water. So it was like in the Stone Age, they, they, they carried uh, two buckets on, uh, I can't on remember. Back. Yeah. And um, during uh, some um, special holidays, the armist uh, would sit my mother on a chair and put a garland of flowers uh, around her. And he had a little boy. When my brother grew out of some clothes, and this boy used to run about just stark naked, my mother gave him some clothes and he came um, to demonstrate what he looked like in these clothes. But only once, later on, I don't know what he did with the clothes, but later on he carried on. <laughs> the local Indians brought everything to the camp. There were stalls with fruit, later on with meat. Uh, also some Polish uh, uh, chaps uh, opened um, shops selling Polish sausage and so on. They brought flowers, uh, uh, fruit, and uh, <clears throat> Because ours was the last uh, barrack and then there was the cinema, some of the Indians who worked in the camp um, uh, lived there, so it was like uh, very, very um, primitive. Um, there was just a stick, some cover, and the women used to grind. There was a crop called Jugara, I don't know whether it's kind of corn or what it was. Uh, now, also because we had no ceiling, no floor, <laughs> the women used to come and spread a mixture of cow dung and clay. And <clears throat> the Indian girls, uh, young women, used to walk along the streets between uh, our barrack and advocate there. Um, some Polish people taught them a rather rude word for for this, so they would uh, go around shouting, uh, fresh sheet, <laughs> good sheet, for uh, also ice cream because it was so hot. They would sort of say, Krakowski Lodi, Warszawska um, Lemoniada, Taka Jimna. It, it, the strange thing is that for the five years that we lived there, we managed to cooperate very well with the Indian population. Say the postmaster even learned to speak very good Polish because the Indians picked up words in Polish because we had no common, common language. None of us spoke English. None of those people who uh, who had stalls and so on, spoke English at all. So they learned to 
to so speak. So were the Indian uh, people working inside the camp? Yes, there were lots of people. Like I told you, every family had to have someone carrying buckets of water. Uh, the, the, there were these people who had stalls. There were women who offered to do the washing. There was a river, Panjganka nearby, so they would sort of thrash this washing against some stones and, and um, clean it that way. Yes, we had lots of people. The most exciting thing was scouting, camping, away from, from the camp. Uh, the first uh, uh, camping used to be in Panhala, which was uh, belonged to the Maharaja. And later we camped in a, on the edge of a real Indian jungle. And I remember all sorts of activities like uh, shooting bows and arrows and, and getting um, various, uh, you know, in scouting there all sorts of grades of, of getting uh, um, sp sort of specific things if you want to be a nurse or whatever. So was uh, we had to get up ever so early, wash in cold water in the river, um, sort of get ready. I, I think these are the, the best memories of that time. One is scouting. What is the other? Do you have any other memory which you... Yes, I was very fond of reading. And my father, who was for a time in Palestine before they went to Italy, used to send me... All in, in the army, they, they published Polish books which survived pre-war. Uh, <clears throat> stories, uh, fiction stories, uh, and uh, I, I had so many, <clears throat> some of, of my schoolmates liked to borrow them, so I had a little stamp, Własność Teresy Kurowski, belongs to Teresa, my maiden name was Kurowska, I put that stamp and people, um, when I was still in a junior school, there were two rascals, two twins, and I fancied one of them, and it was very exciting when he walked me from school to exchange, borrow another book or something like that. It was all very innocent. Uh, um, as far as sort of uh, boy-girl relationships, we would sort of, you know, go for a walk or, I don't know, maybe some people went as far as kissing, but uh, mostly not. They would just sort of parade with their, the girls would parade with their group of friends and the boys with theirs. And there was a, a, a wider street, main street, where in the evening um, people would parade and maybe exchange some remarks. We didn't know anything. We celebrated Indian independence, but we didn't know anything about the partition between India and Pakistan. But what we were, uh, you know, having gone through all the deprivation in Russia, we were very, very, we sort of felt p poverty and we empathized with it. And I remember thinking, uh, what, what difference there was between, say, during um, there was a coronation of a new Maharaja because they adopted a new one, and <clears throat> there was an elephant docked with, you know, huge rubies, precious diamonds, and then there were these people living on, on the verge of starvation. And uh, also another thing is that. Um, um, we sympathized with India wanting independence because our country was occupied. And uh, the Indian people found it strange at first because the only Europeans they knew were the British who treated them rather as sort of 
second class citizens, and they, they couldn't understand that we didn't. Uh, one of our friends, Danka, told a story how they were uh, traveling in a, a small bus to, to the seaside, and the driver kept stopping in villages because it was in 1947, just before independence. And he would go meet with um, the people who were holding a meeting. Um, and they said, can we go? He said, no, 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 it's too dangerous for you. Then <clears throat> it, it went on for some time. And then he brought a couple of people with him because they wanted to go to the next village. And um, they were driving in silence. And, and one of them, a bolder one, sort of shouted, British, go home. And our people sort of seconded that. And it was very, the driver explained to them, although we are white Europeans, we are not the British, and our own country is so not free, so we empathize with people. Very well, we, we received letters, uh, and those women who had someone in the army, they would get some ma money as well. No, we knew we were watching, uh, you know, avidly the, the events, what was happening. Then, <clears throat> 1944, Warsaw Uprising, we knew what was happening. There was, um, there was a radio in a common room, and there was a Polish paper printed in Bombay, where they informed us about all the important events that was happening. And about people also who were fighting war? I mean, oh, so yes. Events is a different thing, but how did you find... I mean, when you went to Siberia, then your father, you knew where he was? You knew continuously? No. Because some people had lost. In the, in the south of Russia, a Polish army was formed uh, under General Anders. And <clears throat> my father sort of joined the army. And uh, uh, General Anders uh, was very keen for the families to, to come out as far as possible. Uh, because he knew the soldiers would fight better if, uh, you know, if they were sure that their families were all right. Uh, but the Russians allowed so many people, and then suddenly they stopped. They said no more. So I was actually in one of the last transports, which didn't cover through the sea, but across the mountains. Um, so we were very lucky to to get out of Russia. So, uh, how, uh, tell me the experience. You were there when you witnessed uh, India's independence? Yes, we, we celebrated Indian independence together with our Indian friends. Oh, yes. Uh, we had some contacts with uh, uh, Indian scouts. Uh, so, I think they came. Um, it's described by people who remember more in our book um, in the English version. Ha have you read it? Yeah, I've read it, but I wanted you to say it. How did you, how do you remember celebration of India's independence in Valivade, Kolapur? I just wanted you to relate it on camera. Um, what do you remember of that day? I just remember this sort of, you know, holiday spirit. Then we all went to the to the hall where we used to see films. I can't remember anything specific, just a sort of, you know. We certainly didn't want to go anywhere near um, the, any country. The, the German armies were defeated, but Russia, uh, Czechoslovakia, uh, Hungary were really occupied by the Russian armies, so we didn't want to. And some of the people who did go back uh, had very bad experiences, they were either imprisoned or... So no, we came to England very reluctantly, because after India, 1947 was terribly, terribly cold, it was damp, there was no central heating anywhere, we didn't know the language. So, you know, my compatriots come now, sort of thinking England will offer them a better life. But at that time, we didn't like coming to England at all. So how did you come back? Do you remember your mother, your brother? Uh... We, we traveled uh, because 
uh, there was an act of parliament passed uh, uh, which gave the Polish soldiers the same rights as the British soldiers. So anyone who served, like my father, in the Polish army and the British could bring their families. And uh, we came, we traveled by a boat called Empire Brent and uh, came to, to Passigworth, I think, uh, a transit so, camp. So It was very important because even though we were very aware of the war going on and we were hoping at the end of the war to go back to our own country, uh, we uh, <clears throat> uh, friends at school, scouting, those five years really uh, sort of uh, founded friendships which have lasted to this day. That's why we have these reunions every two years. So even though the war was on, this gave us some sort of semblance of, semblance of normal life and, and uh, um, childhood, which was so, you know, so suddenly <clears throat> interfered with when the war broke out. So we remember this period very, very, um, as something very, very good, blessing. It's really just a friendly association. We only have, we don't have any big funds, just a subscription. Um, and we just, uh, formed it uh, because we we wanted to to meet the uh, friends we we remembered um, and we we have these reunions every two years association of poles in india uh, was formed in the year 1990 but even before then uh, there were some uh, reunions first of the people from balachadi then there were two reunions, 1971 and 73, in London. Um, and we just, uh, we just missed uh, each other's company, and that's why we wanted. And, uh, and the purpose of it is just mainly social. Oh, oh we also we published a book first in Polish, the, then in English. And uh, there's a bulletin published twice a year, which tells us in the meantime, between the reunions, what's happening to our friends and, and so on. Who has died? Lots of our friends this year have died. Um, we are hankering after our, our youth, our, our sort of uh, friendships. And uh, uh, well, it happened in Valivada in India, but uh, um, Yes, and uh, especially that there was this terrible war which we all experienced around, and this gave us uh, a safe sort of period of time where we could sort of be the children we were. I, I haven't been back to any of the trips. I want to remember Valivada as it was, because so, Seeing it from pictures, it's been it's so different. That
call ourselves Indians usually. It's an association of Poles in India, 1942-48. After we managed to get away from Soviet Russia, where they deported us at the start of the war, where their former allies, the Germans, attacked them, we sort of became allies with the Russians. And there was a Polish army from southern Russia. My father went into the army, and quite a lot of families managed to get out of Russia. The first port of call was Tehran. We crossed over to Persia. Um, then we stayed for a bit in Ahvaz, and eventually India, Valivade. Uh, we were very grateful that India offered a sort of safe refuge from war-torn Europe. And because this was the time when most of us were still at school, we sort of formed friendships from school, from scouting. They are so strong, the bonds that, the tires, that we, it survived all the years. After the war, we, every, uh, people went to different parts. Some went back to Poland. Well, we didn't want to go back to Poland, which was more or less occupied by the Russian armies. So we came to England. There was a, an act of parliament passed, which gave those Polish soldiers who served in the Polish army and the British command the same rights as the British soldiers. They could bring their families. But we didn't know the language. After India, it was cold and miserable, so we didn't like it here at all. We really, we were waiting throughout the war. They were telling us at school, work hard, so that you can rebuild Poland after the war. Well, the war ended. There was no free Poland. It was England, but so, but we all had to study, find sort of found families, and after. We sort of established ourselves, uh, we decided to, to form. There were sporadic meetings before then, but in 1990, when quite a lot of us were retired, we um, uh, decided to, to form a formal association. Its purpose is just purely social. We just have, um, our funds consist just of, of the uh, membership fees, eight pounds a year, so we are not a rich an association, and we decided to write a book of our experiences.